All right, so we are in Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be picking this up this morning where we left off last week. And uh, we know uh, from, you know, prior weeks that we've been studying this book that uh, this, what we're looking at here in these texts, we're looking at the very last week of Jesus' life. We're looking at how God's plan for our salvation is truly beginning to unfold in the reality of what's going to be happening. And we have a tendency, I think, in the church today to, um, would be a good word for it, homogenize what the Lord did on our behalf. We like to clean it up. You know, you, you see sometimes pictures of the Lord hanging on the cross and, you know, his hair is brushed real nice and he has a real pretty face and, you know, it's a homogenized, if you will, version of what took place. But I got to tell you, as he is approaching that day very quickly in our text, um, he knows exactly what's going to happen to him. He knows exactly the fact that the word tells us, the scripture tells us that he's going to be abused so bad that people won't even recognize him as a man. That takes quite a bit of beating. He took that for you and me. And he was also not just beaten, tortured, humiliated, stripped naked in front of the whole world. But yet the sin of every living person was placed upon him. This is what he's looking forward to. What do you look forward to? Do you look forward to your car breaking down or someone getting sick? I can't wait until tragedy strikes my house. And No, we never look forward to that kind of stuff. But you know what? We can really learn a lesson from him in how he handled it how he allowed himself to continue to move forward to the cross without stopping. Jesus went, we talked about this, I think, on Wednesday, that Jesus went a little bit further for you. He left Peter, James, and John in one place, and the scripture says, and then Jesus went a little further. He went all the way for us. Because, why? Because of his love for us. Because of the great love that he has for all human beings, for his creation. And so now here we have these questions are being posed to the Lord by our friends, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And uh, we've seen the last couple of weeks A couple of questions. You know, the first question was concerning Caesar and money and all that. That was kind of a political question. That was a question designed to get him in political trouble, right, with the the powers that be. And, of course, the the second question uh, that was asked um, was a uh, doctrinal question concerning the resurrection. And the irony of it is that the guys that asked the question didn't believe in the resurrection, So it just shows you how desperate they are to try to corner him and put him in a a, uh, uh, a place of guilt. Um, But one of the things the scripture says that Jesus responded to them and he said to them, you're an error. You're You're an error because you do not know the scripture. And we stressed that a little bit last Sunday, how important it is for you and me to know the scripture. Because if we don't, then we are subject to whatever flim-flam stuff comes our way. If we don't have the Word of God to filter that stuff through, we can really come out doing some really weird things, you know. I don't think it's God's will that we be weird. I think He just wants us grounded. He wants us serious. He wants us knowledgeable of His Word. Because this is the basic instructions before leaving earth, the B-I-B-L-E, right? This is what shows us the way, and without it, truly, we're left to our own devices, and that doesn't usually work out uh, too well for people. So when uh, they had heard Jesus' uh, response to these questions, um, the Scripture tells us when they heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, 
that the Pharisees got together, and uh, one of them, who was an expert in the law, uh, approached him. So this third question was posed by a Pharisee, and no doubt he was emboldened to approach Jesus because the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection. So maybe this guy's thinking that, oh yeah, Jesus is on our side. He's talking about the resurrection. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees do. So maybe that gives me a little bit of a leeway in here to come in and and to question him and to test him. So as we pick this up, I want to go over to verse 34 and uh, read down through the rest of this chapter. It says, when the Pharisees heard that, He had silenced the Sadducees. They gathered together. And then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. So perhaps the question that they want to ask, maybe they have a couple of different motives. Maybe they're trying to set him up against the law of Moses. You know, the Jewish people looked upon Moses as the authority of the law. And as we look at the question that was posed here, um, again, it was kind of a trap. What would you answer if someone came to you this morning and said, what's the greatest commandment? What would you say? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, steal, commit adultery, have other gods. He did not use any of the Ten Commandments to answer their question, which is one of the very first things that I took note of when I was um, studying for this. And when we look at the Ten Commandments, they're very interesting because they truly are a synopsis. You can really build upon them and write many, many volumes of um, explanation about the Ten Commandments, if you wish. But when you bring them all down to their original and beautiful purpose, you find out that the uh, Ten Commandments are broken up to two parts. There's two parts to them. There's that one part um, that has to do with our responsibility to God. And then the other part is our responsibility to each other. So the first four talk about our responsibility to God, and then the other ones talk about our responsibility to one another, six of them. And so as we look at that and we look at Jesus' answer, it starts becoming really clear that his answer is actually um, a condensed version of all of the Ten Commandments. He puts the two pieces together to make one beautiful picture. Now, in the Jewish culture, and like I had asked you a minute ago, what is the greatest commandment? There was always a lot of answers that would pop up. What's the greatest commandment? Well, during the day of Jesus, you know, we were talking about the scribes, We were talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and how they would interpret the law for the people because you're not smart enough to interpret the law for yourself. So you have to have somebody else do it for you and then you have to adhere to their interpretation of it. Sounds familiar. Sounds like the stuff's still going on these days in certain ways. But the idea was, was it circumcision? Was it sacrifice? Was it the ritual washings that they had to do? Which was the greatest commandment? And it's interesting, as I said a minute ago, he does not go to the Ten Commandments. Now, the Sadducees, being lawyers of the law, they're probably thinking he's going to go right to the Ten Commandments. He's going to quote one of the commandments from the Ten Commandments. 
Secondly, he did not go to the traditions of the elders either in his answer, which is what the Pharisees would have been looking for. Tradition or their interpretation of these scriptures. And third, he did not even go to the Hebrew scriptures to answer their question. He went to the Greek version of the Old Testament. It had been translated from Hebrew into Greek because Greek was the main language that was spoke. This Greek version of the Old Testament, I guess you could kind of say, was the NIV Bible of its day. It was made a little supposedly easier to understand for the people. Some people are scared to death of the old King James Bible. The these and the thous and, you know, all those, well, I can never understand the King James Bible, you know. But now we have the new King James Bible, which is a lot easier to read and understand. But even then, during the time of Jesus, they would read out of the Greek version of the Old Testament, which was called the Septuagint. And then fourth, Jesus quotes from two different scriptures in the Old Testament. The first one he quoted from is Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then, of course, Leviticus 19, verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Have you ever been sharing with somebody maybe or teaching or witnessing to somebody and as you're talking to them, God has given you scriptures? Come to your mind, little scriptures that might come to your mind. Sometimes they're really simple scriptures like for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Sometimes they get a little bit more involved and a little bit deeper. And a lot of times, most of the time, the Holy Spirit as he's speaking through us He'll bring to our mind more than one scripture from more than one book to make one point. Now, you might think that Jesus was just a wandering carpenter, didn't really go to Bible college or anything, but he knows the word inside and out. It's already in him. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the word. He's like the walking Bible, right? So it would be nothing for him to draw scriptures from here and one from here and bring them together to make one very important point. That's what you call navigating the word of God, using it in the proper way that it was intended to be used. God wants us to have that same ability also. And so Mark, even in his gospel, he goes a little bit further. This is what Jesus said in the gospel of Mark. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. And this came from Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. The second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandments than these. So Jesus' answer to this question, um, in answering the question, he establishes these two commandments and makes them the priority over all of the other commandments. And he sums that up by saying all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now let me ask you, Can we really learn to love one another without loving God? I don't think we can. I don't think we have the capacity in us to do that. I think that there is a system and priority of the right combination of things that need to take place in my heart in order for me to be able to relate to these two separate commandments. To love God. Not just to love God, but to love God with all my heart, emotion, passion, right? 
and to love God with all my strength, my physical strength, never to bow to the enemy, never to give away territory to our adversary. With all of my soul, my, that's my intellect, my mind. Literally, that's what the soul part of you is. It's your mind. It's your emotions. And how many of you know that when we come to the cross, sometimes our mind is tweaked. Sometimes our mind doesn't think the way it was designed to think. Sometimes it's full of revenge and hate and unforgiveness and selfishness and just the world. And Paul tells us in the Word as we're coming to the cross, as we're growing in the Lord, one of the, one of the obvious signs of your personal relationship and mine in coming to the Lord is changing the way we think. We change the way we think. We change the way we process information now because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And so he mentions that part of our being also. With all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. That, folks, encompasses every little part of us, every piece of our being, if you will. You know, the world does not know about the love of God. They can try to know. When I was young, we tried to find love. And we all walked around doing this, remember? Peace, brother. Right? But did it last? Did it work? No, it was counterfeit. We were, I guess you would say, barking up the wrong tree. We weren't looking in the right place. And I'll bet you the young people today feel the same way. They want peace too. They want purpose too. And as you look out there and you see them out there, and and the adults too, they're out there trying to seek out that very thing that they're dying of thirst for, and they'll never be able to find it in the world. You'll never be able to find it in your unbelieving friends. Or for us adults, unbelieving adults that we may come in contact to with, whether it be at work or wherever. We're constantly engaged in people that are in the world. And it's really important for me to understand that I need to love the Lord, the, my God, with every fiber of my being. That means he needs to be number one in everything over and above my relationships, my status, my finances, my health, my children. He needs to be the most important thing in our lives without compromise. And if that's not the case, then you can't say, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're kidding yourself. And uh, you know where that gets us, right? doesn't get us too far. When we love God and when we love our fellow man correctly, then we are fulfilling the whole law of God. Think about the logic there. It's so pure and so beautiful. If I love God with all my heart, I'm not going to do things that offend him. If I love God with all of my heart, I'm going to do things that bless him, that please him. I'm going to have a desire to want to be near him. You see, that's the difference between being a legalistic religious person and being a born again in God's grace person. If you're stuck in the law this morning, you have to follow rules. But I'm going to tell you something about the liberty of Jesus. I don't have to do anything. Oh, that's kind of weird sounding, isn't it? Well, let me finish the sentence. I want to. I want to do the things that please the Lord. He's taken that religious mind out of me, and he's placed in me instead of I have to go to church. I want to go to church. I want to be around my brothers and sisters. I want to learn more about God. I love worshiping with our worship team. He took my have to and he put a want to in there. 
And when that happens in our lives, it's transferable. Not only to our relationship with God, but also to our relationship with one another. Thus you have that shape of a cross in a sense. My relationship to him and the relationships we have with one another. They, one complements the other. And you can't have one without the other. Very important to understand. I think people have a problem that perhaps in their lives they get to a point where they feel pretty good about themselves. And when the word sin pops up, it's like, we don't use that word. That's an ugly word. It's a negative word. We don't say negative things, right? It's all about positivity, good energy. Oh, that's all well and fine, but what about honesty, right? What about looking in the mirror and saying, I know for sure that I've come short of God's glory. Hard part of that is for someone to come up and confess it. The hard part of it is for a person to step down from their little throne that they've established for themselves, to step down off that throne, get on their knees before God's throne, and say, God, I deserve death. I'm a sinner. I've lied to you. I've disrespected you. I've ignored you. I've kicked sand in your face. And what did you do? You loved me. What did you do when I deserved eternal damnation? You gave me eternal life. Wow, that's a trade-in that's worthwhile, don't you think? I think so. In John, uh, the Gospel of John, in chapter 13, John said this, A new commandment I give you, Love one another as I have loved you, and so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. That's the litmus test. That's the proof in the pudding, if you will. The legitimate reality of loving God with all of my heart And also loving my brother as myself. It's kind of sad to think that God had to give us the command to love, right? You would think we'd be able to just say, oh, yeah, I love. It just comes natural to me. But how do you define love? How, how do you define that? What does that look like? I mean, I really love the sunset. I love a nice-looking motorcycle. I love my wife. I love God. Is that all the same? Or perhaps are there different types of love? Well, there's at least four different kinds of love. And the love that we're talking about here this morning is what we call agape love. It's a love that was introduced to the church through the Holy Spirit. It was a love that Old Testament people really didn't experience because the Holy Spirit did not come upon them. But you and I have the Holy Spirit today. And that love, that agape love that God has for us and that love that we share with Him and that love that we share with one another. You know what that love, when we share it with one another, you know what it does? It forgives. It doesn't hold grudges. It doesn't demean brothers and sisters. It doesn't backbite or gossip. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. To me, that's one of the biggest things about the love of God. Could you imagine if God kept a record of every time you made a mistake? There would be volumes and volumes and volumes, right? Well, people do that to each other. A lot of times in marriages, I hate to say, we keep a record. I remember in 1972 when you, you know, so I'm never going to trust you again, and I can't forgive you, you know. That is not love. Love comes from God and is transferred out from us to one another. 
And he says that all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This tells me something important, that when God established his laws for us, like the Ten Commandments and the principles that are taught in the New Testament, that God didn't just make up these laws just out of the blue. He didn't make up these laws to tie you up, but to set you free. He didn't make demands on us just for the purpose of keeping us from having a good time. So boring being a Christian. All you do is go to church. I've had more fun with my Christian brothers and sisters than I ever had in the world my whole life combined. I don't know about you guys. I hope that's true. But what he did was he gave us these laws for the purpose of keeping us safe from our own selves. He gave us these laws to protect us from the dangers and the pitfalls and the ravages of sin. He wants what is good for us. He knows what's good for us. He knows what's bad for us, just like a good father would. A good father who would say, son, don't go out and play on the freeway. You might die. You're just an old man. You won't let me have any fun. You know, all my friends are running across the freeway, dodging cars. Boy, what an adrenaline rush. Yeah, and I'm going to go out and do it, right? He's trying to keep you from harm because he loves you. He knows what's bad for you. He knows how to protect us so that our lives can be full and free from the danger of premature death, if you will, which happens a lot. So the greatest commandment and the commandment that follows. And then in the last part of our text this morning, in verse 41, it says that while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, He's the son of David. And he said to them, Then how does David, in the spirit, call him Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, verse 44, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So if David calls him Lord, then how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare to question him anymore. So now they've been throwing questions out at him over and over and over. He has uh, humiliated them. He has embarrassed them. He has shown their hardness of heart throughout the answers that he's given. And now they are pretty much done questioning him. I can't get anywhere with this guy. I can't find any reason to find him guilty. And now Jesus poses a question. And perhaps in posing the question, he's explaining why they can't find him guilty. Because he's the Messiah. As a matter of fact, where does the guilt lie? The guilt lies on you guys, not on Jesus. It's interesting when they ask the question, he asks the question, whose son is he? Well, these were students, and right away, you know, they want to get an A on the quiz. So somebody blurts out, you know, he's David's son. He's David's son. Well, they were right. But there's a couple of things about being a Jew that are pretty interesting, you know. There were 12 tribes, and each tribe had been allotted a parcel of land, if you will, and little villages and everything in these little parcels of land. Everyone claiming to be a Jew, you had to prove that you were a Jew. You couldn't just go up and say, I'm Jewish, now I want to move into the land of Benjamin. No, you got to prove that you're a Jew and that you're from the tribe of Benjamin. Pretty important. Secondly, in the Old Testament, again, all the land grants were provided according to lineage. You would have to prove your roots. Third, 
we have the priesthood in the Jewish culture. That priesthood was chosen from one family, from Levi's family, from Aaron's family. And we had two main classes. We have the high priests, and then we have the Levites. The high priests were exactly what it says, the high priest. They were the ones that went into the Holy of Holies. They were the ones that stood in the presence of God. The other priests, the, 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 Le, the Levite priests, they're the ones that took care of the temple and made sure that it was up, up kept properly and the flames were burning and everything was moving smoothly. But if you wanted to be a priest, you had to prove that you were from the family line of Aaron. And that you were a descendant of Levi, who was the brother of Moses. So if you want to make a Jewish claim to be a priest, then you had to produce a genealogical record all the way back to Levi. So you had to show that you have Levi genes. I just made that one up. <laughs> no. That's a lie. Sorry. <laughs> and one more thing about this. The kings, the rulers, they were all chosen from a specific family line also. They were all chosen from the line of David, the tribe of Judah. And so now this is where we begin to get in to the answer um, of what Jesus is trying to share with these young students about whose son is he? David was the king. So why would he call, why would, why would he call his son the Lord? Why would he call, and literally the Lord here has a couple of different inferences, but one of them would be that he is superior to David. He's greater than David. And the other, uh, in, the other interpretation of that would be an interpretation of deity. So in 2 Samuel 7, this is what the Lord said. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself, talking to David, will establish a house for you. And when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. And he's the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. See, of a king from a kingly lineage who would rule forever. But there's a problem because just down around the corner, when this was told, they all went into captivity. There was no more throne. There was no more king. Everybody was in Babylon. They were slaves. They were being punished. All they had was one hope, and that was deliverance. To be set free. And so that whole lineage, that whole kingly line got severed. And you might look at that and say, see, that prophecy wasn't right. But now let's look at the genealogy of Jesus. It can be traced all the way back. All the way back to his roots. And even in Micah, which is like the very last book in the Old Testament, because the people were so desperate, right before Old Testament times kind of came to a close, another prophecy came in Micah, and we know it very well. It said, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. A messianic prophecy about a coming of an unusual king whose origins are from old. And so we see the prophecies of the Messiah combined together with the prophecies of a coming king from David's lineage. And so the answer to Jesus was obvious to these students. 
the son of David. And by and large, the, the Jews were looking for a Messiah king. They were looking for a man to throw off the shackles of Roman domination, a king to rule in the throne of David, to destroy the prosperity and the power of Rome and restore it to Israel. This is why Jesus didn't fit their model. You know, you get this mental picture when you talk about a king and you see this picture in your mind. He didn't fit that picture. He was meek and he was mild. He was not a political rebel. He wasn't an anarchist. He could draw a crowd together, but not inside a riot. He could heal. He could teach about the kingdom of heaven. But the problem is that the leaders of time, they weren't worried about the kingdom of heaven. They were just worried about the kingdom of Israel. They wanted things to be the way they used to be. So who's talking here? Let me share this with you before I close. The question, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, called him Lord? For he said, the Lord said to my Lord. So let's break that up just a little bit before we close so it's a little clearer to us. First of all, David is speaking from Psalm 110, verse 1. He's also speaking in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking through him, if you will. We see that here, that David was speaking through the Spirit and calls him Lord. Well, there's two Lord words we have here. The first one is the Hebrew word Yahweh. Speaking of God the Father, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah is probably better known. And then we have the other word for Lord, which refers to the Messiah, and that word is the word Adonai, or Adonai. That's the Messiah. So you got the Father speaking to the Son, who is the Messiah, and he's telling the Son, sit here at my right hand until I make all of your enemies your footstool. Let me ask you a question this morning. Where is Jesus right now? Where is he at? He's at the right hand of the Father, right? Just like this prophecy said. And do you know that there's going to come a day when he's going to put his foot on his enemy's neck and declare victory once and for all? Victory over sin and death and pain? That day will come. This can be only the Messiah. This can be the one that the world has been waiting for for so, so long to be revealed in the last days. I just want to encourage you. I'm going to have the worship team come on up, please. Um, I just want to encourage you this morning. You see, in verse 46, it says that no one was able to answer him a word because they knew that they would have to acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. The last thing that they want to do. And it says from that day on, no one dared to question him anymore. Interview over. Done. What happens when they walk away? They walk away finding him not guilty. But we'll see here in a few weeks that they come up with new plans and new plots to frame him, if you will, and set him up. But we've learned a lot this morning about love and how that love needs to be transferred from God's spirit to my spirit and then from my spirit to you. Same with all of us that we all share that same thing in common. You know what's going to be a mind blower when we get to heaven? You know how many of us there's going to be? I mean, we think about our little church group right here, but, but think about the millions and millions, maybe billions of people who have come to know Christ over the years, over the millennia. 
They're all going to be there. You know, have you ever seen those documentaries about the penguins and there's 10 million penguins and they're all standing in a group and blah, 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 right? And mama's out there trying to get food and three weeks later she comes back and she knows right where to go to find her little baby out of all of them penguins. That blows my mind. And I'm thinking, well, gosh, when we all get to heaven, if I'm looking for Cindy, how am I going to find her? It's too many people. I think I'll be like the penguin, and I'll just be able to go right over, and they kind of nod at each other, you know, and, you know, it's all going to work out for the good. I just want to ask you a question. Are you going to be there? Have you made that commitment to Jesus, Ask for forgiveness of sins, to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. I'm willing to be willing to do whatever you want me to do, Lord. That's the question I'm asking you this morning. Are you willing? Are you lined up with his will? Perhaps not. If you need prayer, I guess this is where I'm going with this. Once again, every Sunday we go through this together. Lonnie and Chris over here, they would love to pray with you. Please don't leave if you need prayer. Stay. People that are with you will wait. They'd be happy to wait. We want you to leave here fixed. We want you to leave here encouraged with a clear conscience before God. What a blessed way to go home on a Sunday afternoon. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time here together today. Your word is amazing. Your word is unbelievably simple. That we can, as mortal beings, Lord, that we can absorb it and understand it because of the Holy Spirit living in us. So, Lord, help us to continue to feed upon it, to learn. Lord, we want to yield ourselves to you We want you to be the potter, and we want to be the clay. And we want you to mold us and make us into the people that you desire us to be. And help us not to resist. Help us, Lord, not to dry up and become stiff, but to be soft and pliable in your hands. Thank you so much, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.